Amen. We have this morning, what have we got? What do we have? Anybody looking? Any guesses? Martine is flipping through her Bible. Joe? No. No. Martina? It's actually valve. It's almost like you say the V on the end of it, although we spell it V-A-U, but um, it's, it's another letter in the Hebrew alphabet. A lot of them look very similar, do they not? Like we have uh, our one from last week, like that, and the one before that, we have, it looks very similar to the one that we just had last week too, all right? Um, but anyway, that's where we are in our Bibles. Take your Bibles, please. Let's go to number Psalm 119. Have you ever had someone scold you for, but with, with good intentions in their, in their mind here and scold you and say, why didn't you ask somebody for help? You ever had somebody to ask you that? And, and then they're kind of scolding you like, you should have asked somebody for help, but you, know, you didn't ask anybody for help. Why didn't you ask somebody for help? What stops us sometimes from asking people for help? Martina. Pride? Okay. What else stops us from asking people for help? Embarrassment. I'm sorry? Embarrassment. Embarrassment. Okay, that's a good one. Anybody else? Martha? Not to bother. Ah, the old not wanting to bother people trick, eh? Okay. All right. Anybody else? Sharon? You think you can do it yourself. Oh, you think you can do it yourself. Well, I don't need somebody else. All right. Okay. Any others? Why did you not ask for help? Any other thoughts? Martha, one more? Oh, you don't want them interfering because you're a control freak. <laughs> okay, that happens. Okay, it's got to be done immediately. All right. Yeah, lots of different excuses that we use, all right? Let's take a look at verse 41. It's the very first one of our vow, or vow, all right? Let thy mercies come also unto me, verse 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word, all right? And one second here. Got him, all right? It's what, what he's asking for here, okay? Let thy mercies come also unto me. He's asking, it's, it's kind of, Help me even when I don't know that I need help, all right? Send your mercies to, 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 to guide me, to help me. Again, the, the guidance is coming from where? There's another one. Two for two, all right? Where's, where's the help coming from? Where's the help coming from? God, more specifically, is coming from God, so that would be the most specific, but how, how's, how's it getting to us? through God's word, but it's coming from God, but, but coming to us from God's word, okay? It's, it's like helping, what he's asking for here is like helping what you do to help a child because you see the child is going to be in danger, all right? And, and to, um, to ask for that help, to ask for those mercies when, when um, I'm trying to think of an example, you know, you, you see your kid is, is, is about to do something, you know, and they're walking along and they, and they knock something over and it's going to land on them and you reach out and you, and you grab it before it can hit them, okay? Or you, uh, they're, they're walking along and they're going to step out onto the sidewalk and you reach and grab them by whatever you can grab them by and pull them back before they can come out, all right? Whether it's by the hair, whether it's by the hood of their coat, hopefully, or grab them by the arm or whatever. But, but it's asking for those mercies for, to step in, okay, where we don't see the danger. And that's what he's asking for here. He says, let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. It says, teach me, what he's saying here is to teach me in your word what's right even when I never consider that I'm wrong. When, it, when you're oblivious to what's, when you're doing something. You ever, you ever done something and, and you know, you, you, you're, you don't think anything about it, and then somebody points out that, you know, you're doing something that's wrong? Like, <laughs> how many of you have ever driven down a one-way street, and there's somebody coming the other way? 
Da, 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 da. They have no idea that they're driving the wrong way on a one-way street, okay? And people are frantically waving at them. I know this happened to me on Deleuze Street a number of times. You know where it splits off and it does that little S-curve there? And, and I'm coming down the one way and somebody's coming the other way and, and they're completely oblivious to the fact that they're doing something wrong. That's kind of where this verse is heading, okay? It says, let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. God's mercies came to Abraham. What, where was Abraham when God first spoke to him? Where was he? Funny name of a little place. Only has two letters. What was it? Ur. Ur. Can you imagine telling people, where are you from? I'm from Ur. Huh? Ur. <laughs> They're waiting for their first syllable before they get to the Ur. He was from Ur of the Chaldees, and what, what, did, what did God do for him there? What did God do when Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees? Martina? He told them to leave. They were worshipers there of, of the stars and stuff like that. They had what was called a ziggurat, all right? And they would go up into that, and then they would very big into astronomy and so forth, that type of thing. But he called him out of that idol worship, that false gods worship, and, and showed him that what he was doing was wrong and promised him a, a great nation and so forth, all right? And God's word, offers, God's word offers us protection. It offers us protection even when we don't know what we are, that what we are doing is wrong, okay? And it offers us protection from that. Look at, let's look at verse 42. See how this whole thing kind of develops. It says, So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. Now this, this word re reproacheth here, okay, it, it kind of leans itself into um, contempt or being mocked, all right, when, when somebody comes up. How many of you have ever been mocked for your faith? All right, and, and somebody's laughing at you or somebody is, is, is making fun of that and, and, and so forth, um, it's, it's, what, what he's asking for here is, is to teach me from your word the answers that I need. You know, in order, for when, when someone is mocking, when someone is mocking God, teach me from your word how I should respond to that, what, what, I, should, what I should say, okay? But in order for this to happen, it says, so shall I have therewith to answer him that reproaches me. Why? For I trust in thy word. But in order to have those answers... What are you going to have to do? What are you going to have to do in order to have those answers? Hide God's word in your heart. Hide God's word in your heart. This, he's not asking for an easy way out here, okay? He's not saying, well, you, you just give me the answers. He's uh, when I'm reading and when I'm studying, like it, it, it's going to take some time on your part. It's going to take some time on my part to spend time in God's word. He's just not going to, you know, give, here's this whole book, but you only, you only really need these three pages. All right, and this page here, and flip over, and, and this will give you the answers you need. No, it's, it's, it's what he's asking for here is, is wisdom as he looks at this, as he spends some time studying in God's word to teach him what he needs to know, what, to, to have an answer. Like it says there in First Peter, to have an answer to everyone that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, okay? It's, it's to have that, have that answer, but it's, it's, it comes with time that you volunteer yourself to spend in studying God's word. Not, it's wonderful that we come to Sunday school and we learn, and it's wonderful that we come to church and we learn, but, and that's only part of it, the Christian life, okay? That there needs to be time where you are alone with God and with his word and spend time studying that and, and comparing scripture with scripture, all right? Like I said, he's not looking for the easy way out, but this, this is in preparation and, and asking for preparation and courage, all right, to stand where he needs to stand. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. He wants to be able to stand. I've, I've made this, this uh, advice, gave this advice to, to an individual once when they were heading off to school. I've probably done it more than once, but I've given this advice when someone was going off to a secular school. And look, you need to make a stand right away, so people understand wh who you stand for, all right? And it's the same with, with if you're going into a new job, 
people need to know where you stand with God. This isn't something that should be hidden, all right? And then they discover after a while, you know, well, that, that you are one of God's children. It's, it's important that you make a stand early and that, and that you hold that stand and to have that courage to make that stand to say, I, I belong to God. We should probably do that everywhere we go, but I'm just saying that in, in a situation where um, you, are, you are going into full time in that spot. I remember when, when I started at the fire hall, I was, I was told by another individual, you can't take that in there. Well, that's what I am. So I'm going to take that wherever I go, okay? And, and it's important to, to make that known who you are and what you're doing, okay? Otherwise, there are brilliant minds out there that will subtly try to turn you away from God as if you are not prepared. And they will bring logic that is wrong, and it's just got a little twist to it, and we're going to look at that in, in, in just a second here. But they'll, they'll do that and try to, in essence, seduce you away from the truth. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Let's go right off the top. What happened at the Garden of Eden? All Satan did to begin with was just, all he wanted to do was cast a little doubt as to what God said was true. And once he, once he got that, that doubt in there, and, and once he moved and get her away from what God had said from his word, okay, not, not, obviously they had no written word at that point in time, but they, had the, they got God's word direct every day. Okay, they, they had it right firsthand, okay? But it, when Satan said, oh, but has God said this? All right? And just to throw some doubt in there, and when he went, once the doubt was there as to what did he really mean, you know, it was, is he depriving you of something? And, and just, just getting, getting them to think, you know, that way. And what happened? What happened? Once that doubt was there, Satan had free rule to go in and say, who, this is the truth, when it was not. And by her being deceived and subtly taken away, eventually Adam fell as well, all right? Casting doubt. You know, the story is told of a, of a little boy who just got saved, and he got saved by the verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have. Okay, you guys know the verse, all right? And he was sleeping in his bed, and he started to have some doubts. You know, I, I don't really feel any different than I did yesterday. And was it really real? You know, because I, I, I don't feel any different. And he, had, and he started getting some doubts as to, well, did I mean it enough? For people like to say that. How many of you have run into someone who's doubting their salvation and they're not sure if they had enough faith? And he got thinking, and then after a while he realized, he says, you know, I, I think this is Satan that's trying to, trying to make me doubt what I did. And he'd heard that... Um, Satan liked, dark, liked darkness. And in his little boy logic, he got to thinking, well, if Satan likes darkness, and he's the one that's making me doubt what's happened here, the darkest place in my room is under my bed. So he got out his little Bible, and he opened up to John 3.16, he stuck his finger on the verse, and he jammed his Bible under the bed, and he said, read it for yourself. God's word, all right? The truth is here. The truth is in God's word, and that's, that's, there's power in God's word. I can remember when I was a young boy, and, and Satan was, a, was attacking me, all right, on thinking that I could lose my salvation. And I remember one night taking my Bible and going to bed with my Bible, <laughs> you know? Verse 43. It says, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. Take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. Now, take this in context with, so shall he, so shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me. Take not thy word utterly out of my mouth. I believe what he's saying here is, I don't, help me not to fail so badly that I actually equip people to deny you. 
Philip Grandin. How many remember the name Philip Grandin? Lived in Paris, lived in St. George in that area. He killed his wife. Here's the, uh, I just, all I did was, I typed, what did I type in my computer? Pastor drowns wife or something like that. That's all I did. And I got two headlines come up. Next two things on my, on my Google search. This was the headline in the Brantford Expositor. Ex-pastor gets 15 years in pregnant wife's death. In the Toronto Star, the headline was, ex-Toronto pastor will go to prison for manslaughter in diabolical drowning of pregnant wife. Why do they have to start it off with ex-pastor? Yep. And you know what he did? He equipped people by what he did to turn away from God. And I believe that's what he's talking about here in verse 43. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. That's it. Plead, pleading with God. Look, I am a failing person. I am a sinner. Please don't let me cause so much shame to your name that I give people an excuse not to listen to what the truth is. All right? For I have hoped in thy judgments. All right? Verse 44. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. What's he doing here? So shall I keep thy law forever and ever. What's he doing? Come on, talk to me. What's he doing? Martina? He's making a commitment. He's making a vow before God. Our vow is a good thing. As long as you keep them. There are some vows that we need to keep. We need to be careful as to what vows we make, but are vows all wrong? No, vows are not wrong, okay? But we need to be careful how many vows, what, what we vow of, okay? And the, and the psalmist is making a vow here. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and verse 4, it says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in what? Fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. You know what he says? If you're going to make a vow to God, you better keep that vow. You've made that vow. Keep that vow. But again, you have to be careful in making a vow. Remember Jephthah? The classic example of the absolute dumbest vow ever made on the planet Earth. God promised him victory over the, 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 the people that were oppressing Israel at the time. And he says, well, if you give me victory, hey, you already got the promise. What are you doing here? God promised it. He said, well, if you give me the victory, whatever comes out of my house first when I come back, I'll sacrifice to you. What's he thinks going to come out of his house? You know, a plant? <laughs> his dog? You know? What came out of his house? His only daughter. He's hoping his servant <laughs> <laughs> or his wife. You wanted her for that. I don't know what he wanted. But th th the point is this. Like, what are you doing making this, this ridiculous vow? God has already made a promise. Be careful what you vow. But are vows all wrong? Vows are not wrong, especially when they're like this. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. It could remind him when he stops, when he starts falling off into to drifting away from God. Look, I made this vow to God. I need to keep this vow. I need to stay strong for God. Okay? Quickly, Ian. You don't think that's a dumb vow? He's just quite, he's, he's promised What's that? He promised himself to be sinless. He's not promising himself to be sinless. He's promising himself that he is going to continue in that. And, and I always tell God I want to, but I never vow I'm not going to because I know I'm probably not going to keep that. Okay. I'm that's, serious. Like, that's, I, I, I think sometimes I'm a coward for not doing it. Mm -hmm. I also know myself enough, but I'd rather die than break the vow. So sometimes I think I'm going to go that way. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go there. Yeah. I promise I'm going to try my best. Mm -hmm. I promise I'm going to try my best. That's, what that's, that's a vow. That's a vow. Well, that, that, that's Prom that I keep. Prom promising to try to, try, try to do your best. Martha? Correct. Yes. So is he violating the vow? No, not really, because he's trying to, trying to maintain that relationship with God. Okay? And I really believe that that's, that's where it's heading, right where Martha hit the nail on the head there. Okay? But it's, it's a matter of, I'm going to make a commitment to God. Okay? 
That's what we need to do. We need to make a commitment to God. And when we fail that, we need to recommit that, to keep that commitment until, all right, to, to keep that continually, all right, continually. That's, that's just to keep that commitment, constantly re reaffirming that commitment to him, all right? Let's look at uh, verse number 45. It says, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. Now, most people would say that the Christian life is not liberty. They would say that liberty is the unsaved because they don't have any commitments. And they can do whatever they please, all right? James puts it in, in kind of a unique way. In, in chapter 1, verse 22, he says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And he goes on to say in verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. All right? That he is, he is keeping that. And it's called the law. It almost sounds like an oxymoron here, doesn't it? The law of liberty. <laughs> Okay, the, you figure you're being constricted by a law, but the law says that you are free. All right, and, and, and there is freedom there, you know. Our country is passing laws constantly that, that tell people that sin and depravity and all these other things, these perversions, is actual liberty. It's not liberty. It's, you're telling people it's okay to be enslaved to these, these crazy ideas. I thought it was, it was, it was rather humorous. Um, I had to go to... Uh, a sleep clinic to, a, and I was back in July, I guess, or August. That when I actually got the appointment, it was probably a year before that, before I asked to go to a sleep clinic because I was. Lenor says I stop breathing while I'm while I'm sleeping. That might be a good thing. <laughs> All right, but at any rate, um, when I had to I had to fill out a questionnaire when I when I went back and. It got down to the part, and it was an online questionnaire. You had to do this in order to confirm your appointment. And it had the question, you know, what sex are you? And I was interested to see what was going to come up. And it came up, male, female. Well, that's interesting. So I clicked male, obviously. And there's the next question after, which one do you identify as? <laughs> but the point is, they needed to know what you really were but they had to be politically correct in saying, well, okay, okay I, I'm a cat, as well as I, I am, you know, whatever, whatever else you wanted to identify as. But they had, you know why they had to know what you really were? Because it makes a difference on the test, <laughs> okay? The other part didn't, doesn't affect the test, all right? What, what kind of, whatever's going on in there is not going on in there, okay? Whatever gears are stripped. But it was interesting, they, they had to ask that question, but they still had to keep themselves politically correct, but they wanted to find out really, what are you, you know? Not what, when you're games. Yes. <laughs> they still need to know, all right? But, you know, there is, there is freedom in, in Christ. We're not bound by... Sin is, 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 a, is a, an evil master. And it will control what you, how you think and what you do. You know, and... and uh, you know, we could, we could take it to the extreme and look at addicts and so forth and you ask them, you know, if, if uh, they think they're free because they, they can do all this kind of stuff, all right? But it's, it's, it's God says that we're free if we are free to, to do what God wants us to do. We're, we're, God's designed you to be something. What's God designed you to be, Dan? A servant of him, all right? God's designed us to serve him. You're absolutely right, okay? And we are free to do that and to be able to do that if, if we will trust in him. Let's, 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 let's just move on here. I, I, you know, as, as I mentioned with Adam and Eve, you know, she had the freedom to make that choice to turn against God. And she turned against God, and what did that do? It put the whole world into the bondage of sin. Now, the, instead of the Instead of Adam and Eve, you know, having the freedom to just, you know, lightly tend the garden as to what they did. No, no, that's not going to be so easy, Adam. Now there's going to be weeds and thorns and all that kind of cool stuff. Your back's going to hurt. And you know what, Eve? It's not going to be fun when you have babies. All right? And all these other stuff that, that, that happened because of sin. There's a bondage there. Okay? 
But let's look at verse 46. They, they kind of tie together here. It says, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. What kind of company would you be in if you followed this verse? Who do you know that I will speak thy testimonies before kings? Who do you know that spoke before kings? Give me one, Martina. Daniel. Daniel. He spoke before, I believe, five kings. Outlived them all, <laughs> all right? But stood for God, made his point known, as we got earlier here in, in the lesson, made his point known right away early. Daniel purposed in his heart that he might not defile himself with the, with the king's meat and with the wine which, which he drank, all right? And he made his point known early. What's, who's another person? Let's, let's find some other good company that we could be in that spoke to kings. Paul. Yeah, All right. Gord? Esther. Esther. All right. Who else? John stuck up for David. To the king. All right. Who else? Joseph. Joseph. Yep. To King Pharaoh. Close enough. All right. Who else? Moses. Moses. Yep. There's another one. David. David. And there's yet another one. <laughs> Elijah. And there's one more. <laughs> the little maid? The little maid? Well, it wasn't to a king that she spoke, but it was to the, the wife of the, uh, of, of the of a high-ranking official, okay? So you're right. As far up as she could go. Nathan to King David. There's another one. It's one that I want you to get. They're like, you got to get this one. We can't move on until we get this one. Yeah. Who? Esther. Esther got said. Okay, think Christmas. Let's move on to think Easter. Let's talk about Jesus. All right. <laughs> Even he would speak to those in authority. Spoke to Pilate. Now, now, when it came to Herod, he didn't say anything, but he was there, okay? And he spoke to Pilate. Good company. All these people that you mentioned. Good company to keep if we will follow this verse and not be ashamed. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings. That could be, that could also include, when we're talking about people of an authority, we move on to oh, it. Uh, Shirley Ann said here, and, and who her, her, her master's wife was, okay? Actually, her master's wife would be her master, all right? But our bosses are, you know, in employment or in anything else, to be able to speak to them about God, and, and it says here, and will not be ashamed. Was Daniel ashamed? Was Paul ashamed? Was David ashamed? Esther was, was hesitant, but you know what? She did it. She went and did what she was supposed to do. Again, kind of in my um, illustration of what faith is last, last Sunday, they both cross that bridge, all right? One might be scared, but you still obey. And, by, by, and that's, that's what faith is. It's trusting even when there's emotion there, okay? She wasn't ashamed. She was afraid for her life. She was, yeah. But, but there's, there's still, my, my point is the emotion that was there, okay? And uh, so, but she still stood up and did what she should do. And it's important here, and in this case here, we're talking about being ashamed of the testimony of, of God, okay? Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed for the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and praise the Lord, also to the Greek or the Gentiles or everybody that's in this room, all right? Psalm 119, verse 47. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. It's a delight. How much of a delight is it for you to spend time in God's word? I was talking with, with someone this week, and 
they were just asking some questions, Bible questions, and I was going back and forth with them on, on that, and I grabbed my Bible, and we were flipping through and so forth, and we were just texting back and forth. And at the end of the text, this is the text that I got back from that individual. I love this book. See new things every time we dig deeper. That's delighting in God's word. That's what he's talking about here. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. How much do you enjoy it? How much do you, how often do you sit down and just try to dig deeper into God's word, comparing scripture with scripture? Or do we, are we satisfied with reading my eight little verses and then closing my Bible and going off and doing what I need to do for the day? How much do we delight in his word? Just soak it up like a sponge. Last verse here. Verse 48. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. My hands I will lift up unto thy commandments. All right? What he's doing is reaching up from where he is to where God is. Understand that God is never going to lower his standards, lower his expectation down to where we are. It's up to us to come up to his level. All right? It's, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't compromise with sin. We do. We do. But we ought not to. We, we do when, it, when it, it involves another member of our family. We'll maybe let, let something slide because it's somebody that we care about and then we'll, we'll lower what our expectations were last week because of something that somebody we care about does and change doctrine, all right? Cannot do that. He doesn't, he doesn't come down to our low level of, of behavior. It's up to us to reach up to him. You know, this, this idea here that, that God accepts you the way you are, God will forgive you and bring you into his family the way that you are, but God expects you to repent of your sin, not to continue in that sin. Well, you know, I'm, going to, I'm just going to do this, and if God doesn't like it, then it's too bad for him. <laughs> yeah, okay? We need to come up to, to God's level here, all right? We need to love God's word. We need to take... Yeah? We need to love his word, and we need to take the time to set aside all else, and, and look at this, what it's saying here. It says, and I will meditate in thy statutes. It kind of jumped out at me as, as I was looking at this. It's not, I will meditate on thy statutes. I will meditate in thy statutes. What's the difference? What's the difference between meditating on the statutes and meditating in the statutes? In hmm? In. If you're looking in, it's deeper. It's deeper? Okay, Brother Wayne? On is external, in is internal. Yeah, okay. It's looking on something. You are coming from, like Wayne says, you're coming from the outside looking at and, and looking, well, you know, that's a good thing. But from looking in your statutes is I'm living in these statutes and I'm seeing what they are from within. It's a personal thing. Isn't it cool how this one little tiny word here, actually one letter, makes a difference in, in what the Bible is saying here. The I for the O. I will meditate in thy statutes as opposed to just on them. It's a matter of living it, a matter of, of putting it, a matter of making that commitment to God. This is such a powerful chapter, this whole Psalm 119. Not sure who wrote it. We know they were, it was God that wrote it and just inspired somebody to pen it. All right, we know it's coming from God. But for, for him to, to, to say this, my hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Because his commandments, see, see how he's loved them? He's living those things. He's trying to find out what it is that God wants for him, how God wants him to live, and live in that, and examine that, and spend time meditating on what is it that God wants from me. But you know what that takes? It takes personal time. This time is, is valuable. This time is, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, okay? But there needs to be time that you spend at home, that you spend in the quiet, that you spend with the TV off and the phone in another room, okay, or something, in order to spend that time with God. It is so, so very important that we meditate in thy statutes. 
All right, let's pray. Precious Father, again, I thank you for your goodness. And Lord,